Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about something, uh, a topic, a video that I didn't really think I'd ever have to make a video about. The fact of the matter is, the EPA freight train is here. It's been coming for a long time and now it's upon us. No, the thumbnail isn't clickbait. Could this mean the end of the performance world for Harley-Davidson motorcycles? Maybe not but it may mean that you have to change your expectation of performance. Let's talk about a few things. Most of you guys in the Harley world have been around for a while. You remember muscle cars. Let's go back to 1970. In 1970, you could go to the dealership and buy yourself a 455 HO Pontiac. That 455 HO Pontiac made somewhere around 350, 360 horsepower and a whopping 500 foot pounds of torque. That's pretty impressive. Well, by 1975, that 455 HO made a whopping 200 horsepower and around 320 foot pounds of torque, give or take. That's a big difference. Why did that happen? Well, over the course of 1970 to 1975, and I think the 455 HO completely went away sometime around 1976 or 1977 because it could no longer meet emissions requirements. It could meet EPA regulations. But from the course of 1970 to 1975, you had the introduction of PCV valves, positive crankcase ventilation valves. You had smog pumps. You had, you know, preheated headers. You had all these things that came into play that made a drastic change in that engine's ability to make power. Well, that reality is among us now in the motorcycle world. Now, if uh, we also think in the automotive world, today you can go to a Dodge dealership, for example, and buy yourself a Dodge Demon. That Dodge Demon, six, 700 horsepower, I think is what they are. It's insanity. The Z06 Corvette, all this stuff. We're talking unbelievable horsepower per cubic inch numbers that we're seeing today compared to what they were many, many years ago. It's unbelievable. And they're all EPA compliant. They're proving in the automotive world that you can make significant power and still meet EPA compliance. Problem is, the motorcycle industry has always been a decade or two or maybe even three behind the automotive world. It's vastly different. And that's what we're faced with. So let's look at a little bit of history when it goes to, you know, EPA regulations and stuff for motorcycles. Now, I'm, I'm going to give some estimated dates here, and I want to encourage you guys to do your own research. Hit Google, do your thing. But sometime around 90, uh, 1997, I think, was one of the first uh, writings of EPA compliance uh, for motorcycles. Now, it... I think there was another back in the 70s that had to do with exhaust and mufflers and modifying mufflers. Uh, so from that one, I'm not sure the exact date there. But regardless, when you get to 95, 96, somewhere around there, there was the first one. And that's also coincidentally the same time that Harley first came out with fuel injection, which I believe first appeared on Roking Classic in 1995. Well, the next variation of that was in 2007. And in, if you remember in 2006, that was the last year you could purchase a carbureted Harley-Davidson. And even in 2007, that was the first year of the carbureted Sportster and everything else, or excuse me, the fuel-injected Sportster and everything else from there was fuel-injected. Well, the next one was written in 2010 that had to involve catalytic converters. And that was, you know, Clean Air Act. Basically, if a vehicle came from the factory with a catalytic converter on it, you could not remove or modify that catalytic converter. And that happened in 2010. That was the first year, again, for catalytic converters on Harley-Davidson's. Now, if we think back a bit, uh, there are some things that have happened in the industry over the course of several years. First off, you know, when you had a stock muffler, a budget-minded person that wanted more sound or performance, you would use a hole saw and you would cut through that baffle they had in their pipe and remove the baffle. Okay, so then let's move on to the carbureted bikes and you would do things like the little plug that was put in the place of, uh, in, in, in the base of a CV carburetor for the auto mixture screw. You, all those plugs were there and you couldn't adjust it. So what you would do is drill a hole in that plug, remove that plug and that would give you access to the auto mixture screw allowing you to adjust it. 
Well, in that event, you were also removing EPA compliance. Now let's move on to 2007, and there were a lot of companies that made what I will call defeat devices, that you could remove an oxygen sensor and you could plug in this defeat device where the oxygen sensor was, tricking the ECM into thinking there was an O2 sensor there, an oxygen sensor there, and that would allow you to tune the bike and it wouldn't try to make changes, it wouldn't throw a check engine light and all that. And a lot of companies that made those things got dinged and fined back in the day, back in 2007 for making those devices. Well, then now we're at 2010. Well, reality is for many years, uh, exhaust companies have been making exhaust systems that did not have catalytic converters in them. People have been cutting head pipes and removing catalytic converters and all those things, which are in fact in violation of the Clean Air Act that was passed in 2010. That's the freight train that's been coming for a very long time. Now, let's move to the other things. Tuning systems. We, uh, most of you would have to re know and remember if you're anything Harley-Davidson performance, uh, the motor company getting dinged because of problems with EPA compliance and tuning systems. That transition from the, you know, the race tuner, the super tuner, and then the street tuner having to meet EPA compliance. There was one major very good company in the tuning world that decided to get out of the tuning business because of EPA compliance. And then, of course, other major companies that decided to develop new products and get that emissions uh, uh, approval to get that emissions compliance with their tuning systems. But we're dealing with several different organizations here. First off, you have CARB, the California Air Resource Board. Uh, I believe it's somewhere... Uh, check out for yourself. I think it's somewhere around 12 to 14 or 16 states, give or take, that have adopted CARB as an emission standard. So California Air Resource Board standards have been adopted by other states. Well, then you have EPA standards, how it pertains to manufacturers. And uh, I believe it's there's multiple tiers in that standard. And you're a manufacturer that produces more than 3,000 motorcycles. You have EPA to worry about. And also, they're the organization that determines the testing standards for EPA compliance. Well, then you also have the Clean Air Act, which had to do with you know, air cleaners that would vent crankcase uh, uh, gases to atmosphere. You also, and with that, was catalytic converters. This is, <sighs> it's been a long week, and there's been a whole lot to this. And I have to tell you guys, I, I have, you know, over the past several weeks and months, I have been talking to many shops and manufacturers, and I've talked to distributors uh, key people in this business, all of which has asked me what I think about this, where I see this going, what the direction is heading, and all this other kind of stuff. The reality, the thumbnail ain't fake, guys. The freight train is here. And if any of you wanted to, you could go to EPA's website and see the reality of these things. You know, diesel shops, automotive shops uh, that were, in, you know, removing EPA compliance components, things like DEF, diesel exhaust fluid systems, EGR systems, things like that. Removing that from vehicles that they were originally equipped, there were fines imposed for in excess of $40,000 per occurrence. Think about that for a second, guys. $40,000 per occurrence per vehicle. Uh, there also are posts publicly on those websites where Settlements were offered where some shops paid fines in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. I pulled one up at random the other day. It was a company that made headers for diesels. And it wasn't a very big company, and they it settled on a fine of over $300,000. Now, let's put things into perspective. The majority of the motorcycle industry, are, they're very small shops, shops like myself. One, two, three, four employees, not very big. That's the majority of the aftermarket motorcycle industry. A single fine of thirty to forty thousand dollars could be just enough to close their doors, to put them out of business. It's a scary place for us to be. Very much like the people that bought the nineteen seventy HO Pontiac versus the people that bought the nineteen seventy five HO Pontiac. Performance expectations and things could have to change over the coming years. 
your expectation of gain based off the performance enhancements that you make for your motorcycle may have to change because to a large degree, you have to consider the position that the shop is put in. As you guys know, I'm an advocate for you as consumers, but I also own a shop, whether I'm your chosen shop or not. The reality is a shop has to make a choice. Do they continue to knowingly violate these standards at the risk of having very large fines, or do they comply for now? Until some sort of questions are answered, there are many questions that are being asked right now. Distributors are scrambling. Parts manufacturers are scrambling. I mean, everyone's scrambling trying to figure out what we can do and what we can't do. We still have market demand and consumers like you that want a, a particular result, a desired result. And because of the new standards placed on us as shops and the position that we're in, we're in potentially exposing ourselves to fines as that could put us out of business, we have to weigh that risk and reward. Now, for myself, I'm going to tell you, I'm not willing to put myself in that position. If, if you're someone, if you happen to be with the EPA or CARB or the Clean Air Act Force, whatever you want to call it these days, if you guys happen to watch this video, I would love to work with you. I would love to reach out to you and see if there's some kind of happy medium that we can come, come out with in this whole thing. You know, motorcycles are a very small percentage of total registered vehicles on the road. And the minority of states have adopted CAR, but that necessarily counties in each state may not have adopted emissions requirements for a vehicle to be legally registered, more than likely because of they don't see the uh, environmental impact that a motorcycle can make. Maybe in that region, there are not enough motorcycles registered in that area to make enough of an impact on the environment they deem it necessary for them to have emissions testing requirements. Who knows? There's so many question marks with this whole thing. You know, for me, I have to consider that compliance, the risks versus the reward. And I would rather work with someone than be combative with them. One of the biggest things between the automotive aftermarket industry and the motorcycle industry is its size. The fact is the automotive aftermarket industry has an organization like SEMA. SEMA is a very big organization and they've been fighting the battle for a very long time. This goes all the way back to the car crusher era is what it was known with in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Crushing old cars that, you know, didn't meet EPA compliance. This freight train is among us in the motorcycle world. The difference is we're very small in, compared, in comparison to the automotive world. The best organization that we have right now in reality is the Motorcycle Riders Foundation, the MRF.org, MRF.org. Uh, what can we all do collectively about this as far as shops are concerned and you as consumers and all that? The best thing that we could do is to reach out to our congressman. Pull up the MRF.org website, write them letters, let them know your concerns and your desire to be able to modify your motorcycle. Maybe tell them things like, here is where your bike is registered. They do not require emissions in my area, everything else. The best thing that we could do is try to communicate with all this and, and contact our congressman. Maybe it needs to be that motorcycles are considered recreational vehicles because they're small, and most of them get great gas mileage. If tuned properly, a bike should get 38, 42 miles to a gallon, give or take, even if it is a hot rod Harley-Davidson. If it's supercharged or turbo, it may get a little less. But the point being, they are fuel efficient. Maybe they it needs to be that motorcycles are, are considered, uh, you know, an energy efficient vehicle or an alternative vehicle because of the fuel economy that they get, the small environmental impact they have. Who knows? I guess the whole thing with this video, guys, is there's a lot of unanswered questions. The big question for a shop is that they need to decide the risk versus the reward. And you guys as consumers, you're faced with the possibility that today a shop may recommend certain parts to you today. Like myself, I may, you know, I, the exhaust I recommend or cam I recommend or air cleaner I recommend could be different than what I recommend to you three, four, five months from now, six months from now. 
there have been so many changes with tuning systems, components, and, and all of these things combined in together over the, the past several months. Uh, it's, it's made impacts, you know, on builds and how some shops are trying to decide, those shops that have reached out to me. What are they going to do in the future? What is their direction of business in the future? With some of them in a complete panic, trying to realize that this, you know, they have a large portion of their business that is focused in this area or this area. What are they going to do in completely changing the direction of their business based on the outcome of all this? So the, the point being is the freight train is here. Could this be the end of what we know as the performance market for American V-Twins, Harley-Davidson's, etc.? Yes, it could be the end of it. Or it could mean that your expectation of performance gain may have to be modified a little bit. Maybe you have to be the guy that buys the 75 Pontiac 455 HO. Or maybe we can do away with all this stuff together. Maybe we can all band together. Shops, consumers, write our letters to the MRF.org, our letters to our congressman, and try to get a handle on these things. Fact is, guys, there is no real answer right now. A lot of people are in a panic. We don't really know where this is going. Shops have to make a choice. And they have to decide that risk that they're willing to take. For myself, I can't take that risk. I have to think of the compliance. And I have to think of longevity. And... Uh, we're in an interesting place in this industry right now. Have patience with your chosen shop. Have patience with your distributors, your parts suppliers. They're not really sure where this is heading either. All I know is that all of us are scrambling to try to figure out what's next and to try to understand what the future of this industry could be. So guys, thanks for watching and send your letters. Check out your websites. Take care of yourselves and each other. Have a good one.